I'm Nikki Shinto from Global Influenza Program of WHO. I'd like to brief you uh, on the meeting on clinical aspect of pandemic influenza. Just right now it's happening and it's a three days meeting starting from 14th uh, October and ending today, uh, which gathered uh, about 100 clinicians and subject experts and also uh, pathologists and virologists to um, understand the current disease and the objectives of the meetings are threefold. The first one is to describe H1N1 disease and gather all the global knowledge to understand the disease and what can we do to prevent overwhelming mortality and severe disease in the next uh, Northern Hemisphere influenza season. Uh, there are doctors from Australia and also other Southern Hemisphere countries to share their experience. Uh, the clear finding from their experience is that this disease overwhelmed emergency rooms and especially intensive care units because of the very severe patients that require special care. And the other important point that is very specific about this pandemic influenza is not like seasonal influenza, it can cause very severe disease in previously healthy young adults, except for those who have underlying conditions and also the very young um, infant, they are normally counted as the high risk group for seasonal influenza. They continue to have severe illness and require hospitalization, but remarkably different is these small set, subset of population that presents very severe viral pneumonia. And um, pathologists and virologists presented their data, and the data was also backed up by animal experimental studies that this H1N1 virus causes severe pneumonia comparing to the seasonal influenza. This virus really likes the lower respiratory tract. That means this virus are likely to cause viral pneumonia comparing to the seasonal influenza. Of course, people don't have pre-existing immunity. Therefore, we can expect more severe disease and hospitalization during the upcoming influenza season. So I'd like to highlight top three groups at increased risk of severe illness and death First of all, globally we are hearing that pregnant women and children younger than two years of age and people with chronic lung disease, including asthma. And also there is increasing evidence than previously known that in severe cases, around 30% of them had bacterial co-infection, especially in severe rapidly progressive disease. The uh, responsible pathogens are mostly pneumococcus and the staphylococcus aureus, which is a frequent cause of community acquired pneumonia. So this highlights also the antiviral, antimicrobial treatment is important as well as their early antiviral treatment. We have increasing evidence that supports that early or timely antiviral treatment really helps to decrease the severe disease. We have about 20 intensive care specialists from the countries which experienced advanced stages of, uh, of pandemic 
and their consistent finding is the delay in antiviral treatment and also delay in getting medical care. The WHO has shipped over 72 countries with its global antiviral stockpile and will continue to support resource limited countries to provide uh, enough um, antiviral drugs to reduce the mortality and severe illnesses and encourage member states and also the clinician to consider early antiviral treatment and will continue to encourage the member states to communicate with its, its population with adequate communication messages that if the virus is circulating, the clinicians have to consider H1N1 infection and do not delay the treatment because sometimes um, clinicians tend to wait to get the laboratory confirmation of the inf infection and this causes unfortunate delay in treatment. So the clinician have to depend on the epidemiological information and have to decide upon the clinical uh, observation of the patient in terms of patient care. And typically, very severe progressive cases in previously healthy adult deteriorate around day three. Day three from the on onset of illness and critical respiratory failure occurs within days and progresses really quickly. So the message for uh, clinicians and patients is that don't miss this opportunity for early treatment, but it, again, it's difficult to differentiate this H1N1 disease from other respiratory diseases, especially during winter, uh, where other uh, viruses and bacteria for the upper respiratory disease circulate. So um, the clinicians should give the patient and caretakers about danger signs. So there are several danger signs that suggest the deterioration of the disease. And do not delay the treatment and encourage patients to come back wherever they find these severe cases. WHO and its partners are providing technical guidance and practical support to help developing countries better detect and treat illness caused by H1N1. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Pilar Ramon Pardo. I am working in the Communicable Disease Project in the Pan American Health Organization. My points will add only the perspective of the scope on the, of the Americas to the words of Nikki Sindo. So the first point is the evidence and data from the Americas region, both from the northern and the southern hemisphere in the clinical description of the severe H1N1 cases and our experience in their clinical management are important for the rest of the world. Special efforts are needed in the region to detect and treat at early stage pregnant women affected by influenza, since pregnancy has been demonstrated as a risk factor for severe complication and death from pandemic influenza. The third very important point is that the knowledge and experience gained in this short time will be extremely useful for the response to the second wave of the influenza pandemic. However, still we need, we have a knowledge gaps and need more data from the Americas on risk factors, use of acetamivir, management of severe cases and other areas. Finally, I would like also remark that PAHO is the Pan American Health Organization is also contributing jointly with partners and other st stakeholders and donors to strengthen the response of the member countries through technical assistance, provision of medicines and other necessary supplies and also to providing advice and support on the vaccines. Thank you. What is the biggest difference that we're seeing in perhaps the way the virus behaved earlier in the year and now? Bias is amazingly stable. 
so far. That's because most people don't have immunity, so the virus doesn't have to drift or change because it can still infect people. So the surprising finding from virologists um, in terms of uh, genetical analysis is that virus is quite stable and has not changed. But as the virus more, uh, spread more and um, penetrate more deeper in the population, we are seeing uh, different presentations, some atypical presentations, including encephalopathy and encephalitis and other forms of um, uh, disease, uh, such as the secondary bacteria of pneumonia, uh, or co-infection with bacteria. Could you give some context? When you say, we've seen emergency rooms overwhelmed in the southern hemisphere, we expect to see severe onset and equally severe cases in the northern hemisphere. We believe that we're seeing an increase in deaths, that there are, as the, I mean, this is all very dramatic, but can you give me some context, like numbers or expectations? Yes, like so not uh, counting? we had uh, a good study uh, from uh, the Australia and the New Zealand land, um, especially in the critical care intensivist um, community, and they compared uh, this season's uh, ICU hospitalization was a previous uh, four to five years hospitalization. It's almost like four to eight fold increase in terms of the number of the ICU hospitalization in Australia and New Zealand. Those are confirmed H1N1? Or are they just all flu? They are all confirmed H1N1. And my, the follow up, there's a an understandable mixed message to clinicians. Just assume that if there are epidemiological presentations of flu that it is likely to be H1N1 and because it can get, especially in target groups, severe quickly, use the antiviral, but at the same time there's no way to know that it really is H1N1. Is there concerns of creating immunity to other viruses that are out there by sort of a rampant use of antivirals? You're talking about antiviral resistance? Yeah. Okay. Um, so far, uh, we have uh, about uh, more, more than 10,000 viruses been tested by WHO collaborating centers for um, antiviral susceptibility. But we only have so far 31 resistant uh, viruses, and a majority of those strains are sporadic, uh, isolated from sporadic cases. And about uh, half of these antiviral resistant strains have been isolated from patient or, or persons under post-exposure prophylaxis. So uh, this poses um, a question and alert that perhaps we should wait until the person gets the actual illness rather than go ahead to uh, prophylactically treat the, the contacts. Um, and also, uh, there are several resistant strains isolated from immunocompromised patients. And this group is already known to be uh, the likely host of antiviral resistant virus strains from seasonal experiences. So these um, patients require special attention and especially the, um, in order to um, prevent a nosocomial infection and further spread of the antiviral resistant viruses, um, the healthcare workers and hospital have to implement adequate infection and prevention precaution uh, for these patients. And also, uh, if possible, frequent monitoring and sampling from these patients are crucial in order to, uh, to contain the um, resistance virus in that setting. Uh, but massive uh, antiviral use is not directly uh, related to the emergence of antiviral resistance strains. Uh, for example, uh, 
through seasonal influ influenza experience, H1N1, seasonal in H1N1. I would really like to differentiate this from pandemic H1N1, but we had experience with seasonal influenza uh, H1N1, widely circulated until the last season, was highly resistant to Seltanvir. But it, it emerges from uh, perhaps northern uh, Europe, but didn't emerge from uh, Japan or, or other European countries, nor United States, where they used uh, Oseltamvir for treatment, but emerged from somewhere else. So it's not directly uh, related. And if uh, clinicians use appropriately and, and give the advice to patients for um, I strictly follow the treatment um, regimen, then there will be a lower risk of emergence of um, resistant strains. Perhaps it might be too early for you to answer this question, but what can you tell us about the virus or the, uh, the vaccine itself and how it's been uh, successful around the world? There's been obviously some concern here uh, from from people who say they don't know if they should go ahead and get the vaccine, um, but what are you seeing so far in the way that's uh, been working out in various communities around the world? So far, the information we have got in terms of the clinical trials, in terms of safety of these um, licensed vaccines, we see enough evidence of uh, the safety as well as effi um, efficiency in developing antibodies uh, comparing to the seasonal influenza. So, but we have to wait um, for a while um, in order to get more actual efficacy in prevention. But so far, influenza virus is quite stable. That means this vaccine is, is very well matching with the circulating uh, virus. So we can expect uh, adequate uh, prevention and protection by the use of uh, influenza vaccine.